The first speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Fennell, who is an associate director at ACOM, and he is involved in, I think, in quite a lot of, of management, but also in research, including a very interesting paper on the extinction of botanical education, which I think is a really good uh, topic also to look into and will affect uh, yeah, quite uh, th this area of, res uh, of, of, of management also and invasive species management a lot in the future. So, yeah, Mark will talk about proportionate on-site risk assessment of invasive weeds and the underlying need for accurate identification. So, please. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Um, so Karen Bacon was to be giving this presentation, but uh, unfortunately she couldn't uh, make it, so I'm uh, doing it in her stead. So the, the focus of today is just to, sort of a call to arms really in the first instance about risk assessment at site scale, at sand stand scale, but then also to talk about the underlying need for accurate identification in this booming uh, identification app uh, usage that seems to be happening and just to make you aware of some of the pitfalls of relying too heavily on them. And Karen did some research in uh, University of Galway uh, on those lines. So I'll talk briefly about um, risk assessment, but at smaller scales than, than are you know, typically published and put out there, and how we might go about that, because it's actually it's, it's, it's quite tricky to get right. Uh, and then also titled, careful now, uh, in terms of use of these new identification apps. So uh, myself and Karen, we started this by just sort of asking a few questions to ourselves. If, if you come across a listed invasive non-native species on a site, should it be removed? So just be, should that just be the default response? So you come across Cotoneaster in, in a hotel in the middle of Leeds, no vulnerable habitats nearby, but it's listed on legislation, should you get rid of it? And I think the answer to that is, is no, there are scenarios where the removal of invasive species isn't necessarily going to be a good thing. In fact, the removal might, might have negative impacts. So assuming, and this is, this is an assumption, and, and as I said, you know, asking questions here, it'd be great to start a, a, a conversation about this. I think that you do need to think before just removing an invasive simply because it's listed on relevant legislation. And if we, if we are going to do that, then you need quite refined risk assessments that work at quite small scales and that are quick and easy to apply. It can't be these national scales, incredibly complicated risk assessments, because you wouldn't have time to do that three times a day, four times a day, dozens of times a week. It needs to be something that's quick and easy to apply. So if you are going to do that, what are the, the most important variables to capture? For the national risk assessments, you can sort of, you can drag in a big net of all the potential in, in impacts of INS, but when you're talking about a, a small site and a small plant where a lot of the decision making is made, I mean, the, the group in this room make decisions on what to do and what not to do in terms of INS managed on a daily basis. So there's decisions being made all the time. But there isn't sort of an accepted site level risk assessment framework from which to work from. So, you know, when it comes to certain species, so Japanese knotweed, floating pennyworth, um, giant hogweed, you know, the, the risk assessment process associated with these is, is pretty straightforward. If you've got it on your site, you, you don't really want it on your site, so you're going to try and remove it. You're going to try and remove it, you're going to try and control it, uh, if that control is feasible. Now obviously with things like floating pennyworth, upstream presence, downstream presence play into this, but all things considered, for higher risk species, species that can essentially colonize most types of habitats where they grow uh, and have a very uh, good ability to spread they're usually going to have some sort of significant impact and you're going to want to just try and get rid of them if control is feasible. But that's not necessarily the case for other species that have limited uh, habitats within which they're impactful. So, you know, talking about the Cotoneasters, Hottentot fig, rhododendron, and I'm not saying that these species aren't problematic and that they aren't high risk in certain scenarios, but unless, you know, it's coastal cliffs, um, you know, midland garden with a potted hottentot fig, you probably don't need to go and, and uh, drop the bomb. And when it comes to Cotoneaster, limestone escarpments are the places where they're going to cause the most issues, and rhododendron, say, 
you know, ancient woodlands and so forth. And the, the, the process for deciding whether or not to implement control of these types of species in situations where actually they're not really doing any harm and there's a very little probability that they would escape into the wild where they would do harm, that isn't well defined. It's, it's less well understood, less well defined, and that's something that I think that we should be talking about. And that's not even talking about the species that aren't listed in legislation, budley and bamboo. Um, there's, there's, it's even more complicated trying to decide what to do for those. So, I mean, where we are now, there's a whole pod, there's, there's loads of options for risk assessment, but they're all quite, they're typically quite large scale. National scale things, regional scale things, um, and they're all generally quite complicated. We're spoiled for choice with protocols and tools and kits and schemes. There was a review recently done, and they looked at you know, 40 different risk assessments, and they sort of complained that a lot of them weren't complicated enough, that they weren't capturing enough of the variables, and they listed up all these different variables that needed to be included in invasive species risk assessments. And that's fine. That's good at large scales, at national scales, at regional scales. But it's not practical on a site or for a stand making dozens of decisions a week as, as a sector trying to control uh, the invasive species on the ground. So this complexity of the risk assessments, the, the, the large number of risk assessments that are out there, really doesn't work at local scales. We, we had a go at it. We, we, we tried to create a tool uh, a couple of years ago uh, within the PCA to, to address this, so a site-level risk assessment. And, you know, full of ideas, well, it has to have this, it needs to account for that variable, and, and soon enough it started ballooning up and, and it was scuppered by complexity. It just became too complicated uh, and it became too hard to develop and the development stalled and stopped. So if we're going to get to a point where we can you know, go into a site, we can see the unusual suspects, the, the likes of uh, Cotoneaster in a, an environment where it's unlikely to do any damage or hot and dust like, or uh, sorry, uh, rhododendron, away from vulnerable habitats. We need something that's nuanced but straightforward. I mean, not dissimilar to the RICS Japanese knotweed guidance or the, the um, professional standard as, as it now is, uh, which is very good news. Um, and the, the flow diagram within that, it essentially takes three variables, presence, uh, impact on amenity, and impact on structures. And it, ha it uses those three variables to do quite a nuanced uh, assessment, but very specific to residential properties. So that might be some kind of a starting point. But it's able to do that with just three variables, not the dozens of variables that you saw on the, on the, on the previous slide. So it needs to be nuanced but straightforward, it needs to be objective and consistent. I mean, most, most contractors in the room probably have some risk assessment methodologies that they use, but they're not going to be um, consistent across the sector. I think we ought to be moving towards a, 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 a risk assessment methodology that's consistent, subjective, it doesn't rely on people's opinions, um, so that the same two people using it would typically always come to the same conclusion. And it needs to work across a range of species and habitats in order to be useful. So trying to decide what those variables should be, increasing complexity, decreasing ease of use, um, is very hard. And what I'm saying here is, let's talk about it. Let's, let's, let's get together as a group and try and decide what variables we need to talk about, what, what variables need to be included to keep it to the absolute minimum that still sufficiently captures risk at a site or stand level. It needs to include, I think, these sort of these five key, key elements. The, the simpleness, it needs to be relatively straightforward. It needs to identify what the impacts are. And that's sort of one of the trickier parts. And I think um, we can learn from the RICS guidance here. Perhaps it's uh, rather than impacts on amenity, it's impacts on land use. Uh, I think structural impacts, impacts on infrastructure, uh, but also things like um, impacts on biodiversity. They, they need to come in somewhere, some sort of impact on biodiversity or ecosystem services. But this, deciding on what those key variables are, that's, that's the next step, and we're not there yet. Other things that I think are quite important are the likelihood that it can spread from that area to a vulnerable habitat. 
and that requires some knowledge of the species and the, the areas where it impacts, but I think it's, it's quite important. It's, the legislation is about preventing escape into the wild, so you really should understand what part of the wild these different species can actually impact. So understanding the likely spread from that area, but coupled with whether it's already abundant in the surrounding area. So let's just say you, you, you've decided there is vulnerable habitat nearby. We need to get rid of this particular species, even though it's not particularly high risk generally. Um, but it's also present, it's also planted in all the surrounding um, land parcels. Then what, what real good is there in just removing from this one land parcel amongst dozens? Not much at all. So I think that's an important thing to factor in. But also, um, potential beneficial, beneficial local impacts. So that's where invasive species planted in highly urbanized environments where there's very other little uh, um, vegetation available are actually providing habitat and benefits that if you simply removed them uh, and didn't replant them, you didn't revegetate them with something equally good, uh, it, would, it, would, uh, it would be a negative impact. So removing these species would actually have a net negative impact. So these are the five core elements that I think need to be included, but as I said, you know, let's have a conversation about that. So moving forward, I don't know what the answer is. We've tried. We tried once, looked at the literature, there doesn't seem to be much there. So let's have a chat. So if anybody wants to have a chat, please get in touch. I'm probably uh, going a bit slow here, so I'll try and speed up to the next section. So Karen, so one of the things about you know, spotting these less common species, the ones that aren't you know, the usual suspect, is actually being able to identify them. Uh, and a lot of people are now using these apps, and it's quite important just in general to know what species you can and you can't identify and how to use the tools that are available to you, especially if you're putting yourself forward as an invasive species specialist. So let's just say you, you market yourself as an invasive species specialist, but actually you can only really identify knotweed, balsam, giant hogweed, and rhododendron or something like that. And you'd walk past the other 100 or so species that are listed, maybe 100 species that are listed. Um, you know, what liabilities are you placing on yourself? You said, I've done an invasive species survey, but actually I don't know what 90% of them look like. So people are using apps, I think, to, to help bridge that gap. Um, but they might be falling into a few pitfalls. So uh, Karen and her team did some research, and uh, Hannah is here, and she'll be out on the table at lunchtime to, to show you some of these if you're not familiar with them. But uh, generally speaking, there's two types of identification apps. You've got generalist ones, and you've got sort of plant or nature-specific ones. Uh, and Karen and her team, Campbell et al, devised a scoring methodology since all of the research on how good these apps were wasn't actually particularly insightful. It, it, it didn't seem consistent, it didn't seem useful. So they put together quite a comprehensive, they spent a long time devising a, a good scoring system. Basically, if the app gets it correct in the first go, it gets five. If it gets it to species level, it gets an extra three, so eight points total. And then going down from there, so if it gets the second image correct, the third, the fourth, with slightly less points each time. If it's only getting it to genus level or family level, you get less points again. So they came up with a scoring system, which, uh, which they think works quite well. And they applied that to some of the more common apps out there. Google Lens, PlantNet, PlantSnap, LeafSnap, Seek, and iNaturalist. And I don't know if people are familiar with box and whisker plots, but a lot of these are showing that the apps really don't work that well at all, except for uh, PlantNet and uh, LeafSnap. These, you know, basically this means that 75% of the time are, you know, uh, only anything, well, box and whiskers plot, <laughs> that most of the time they're getting above about 7.5 on average, okay? So the, the apps are doing quite, quite good at identifying species, but they're still missing it's missing a lot, and a lot of the other apps down at the tail end, the, the zero percentile, so the lowest score is one with uh, the 25th percentile, so the, the first 25 out of 100 would be uh, five out of 10, and so far uh, up the box and whisker plot. But basically, this spread here shows you the, 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 how the major where, where the majority of the scores are uh, relative to, to all the other um, results, so you can see PlantNet are doing quite well, LeafSnap are doing quite well, but the rest, uh, not so much. I mean, some of them, 
are really, you know, flick a coin 50-50 uh, in terms of getting things right. They did another test which was just, is the first answer species level correct? And once again, they found that there was quite a lot of variety between the different, uh, the different apps uh, with PlantNet doing well again and LeafSnap doing well again. And some of them, like literally getting it wrong all the time, basically. So if you're relying on these apps completely, it's, if you're using the wrong one, they might be getting it wrong all the time, which isn't a great starting place. So you do need to be careful what app you use, uh, and especially relying on them, over-reliance on them, is, uh, is, 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 is uh, possibly a folly. So um, Hannah Kenny, who's going to be out on the, on the table, applied the same methodology to a couple of invasives, to a few invasives, looking at knotweed and also looking at rhododendron. And it turned out that the apps that were checked worked, well, several of them worked quite well with knotweed, uh, but one of them, uh, Garden Answers, uh, not, couldn't even identify Japanese knotweed, which isn't great. But for something like rhododendron, which is relatively distinct, I would think, um, the apps generally did quite poorly, with a lot of them regularly getting answers that were just, just rubbish. So the apps themselves often misidentify quite a lot of species, and that goes for native species, that goes for invasive species. So if you are using them, do not rely on them. You can use them to get closer to the answer, but always do a final fact check. So there are issues with using the apps and, and relying on the apps, and they apply both to native and invasive species. And I think... Um, the, the take home message here is that the idea apps are useful, but don't rely on them. Always do your own final verification. And in terms of the, the risk assessment, it would be great if we could come together as a sector, as a group of people, and start talking about the, the best, most simple site level uh, risk assessments that we can use for proportionate, consistent responses to the unusual invasive species that are out there. Um, and that wraps it up. <laughs>